quickly go to the book of Matthew chapter 3. And we are going to read verse 13 through 17. And then we're going to jump into chapter 4 and read one verse. One verse. Matthew chapter 3. Aren't you grateful for the word of God? Matthew chapter 3. If you have it, somebody say amen. Amen. Then Jesus came from Galilee to to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So then he allowed him. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice from another level. Oh, wait a minute. What does this say? Suddenly a voice from Yeah, that's another level. A voice from another level saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Then, somebody shout then. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil goes from one moment of celebration the next moment he's in isolation think it not strange when your life takes turns like that Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil I want to just take the next few moments and you know we've been talking about the life of a worshiper and Worship is more than just the clapping of hands, bowing. It's more than just the dance. It's more than the things that we do on the outside. Worship is a lifestyle. I said worship is a life that you live. It's a life that you live. And so while today I might hit a little bit about worship, I want you to understand that my emphasis today is upon the worshiper and his life. And so for the next few moments, I just want to talk from the subject, wilderness moments. Because even if you are a worshiper, how many know I'm telling the truth? You can love God with all you got. Everything in you loves him. But you will still find yourself walking through a wilderness. Sometimes it's out of nowhere. You'll find yourself in the wilderness. How well do you walk? in the wilderness that's how you know you're growing in God when you can walk through the wilderness spirit of God I honor you today for your presence and I thank you for your glory that is in this place I thank you that as the word is preached as the word is proclaimed as your truth goes forth today that you will do things in people's lives that we can't do for ourselves we need you we want you And we ask you, oh God, to speak in here and do whatever you want to do because you are God. You are the Lord of the potter's house of North Dallas. So you knew who would be here and you knew who would be watching online and you knew who would stay at home. But God, today, wherever they are hearing from, find every hearer. Find every hearer that is in this room. Grab our attention, grab our hearts, alter our lives by your word, and we will give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Somebody clap your hands, hold your head back, and tell him thank you right now. Come on, thank him like you love him, like you want him, like you need him, like you got to have him. Oh! And on your way down to your seat, hit some money and tell in wilderness moments. Yep, they're there. And we all experience them. In 
our text, we see Jesus and he is actually in the third chapter, he is standing in the back of a crowd and he is standing back there watching the premier preacher of his generation whose name was John the Baptist. John and Jesus were actually, they were cousins. And Elizabeth was John's mother and she had been carrying him in her womb for approximately six months and she had never felt him move inside of her. Every mother that is expecting a child knows that by the time you hit six months, you should have already felt something happening inside of you. And one day and one knock at her door would change everything. You never know how just one day and one knock at your door has the power to change your life forever. Mary had come to Elizabeth's house to tell, to tell Mary, I mean to tell Elizabeth that she was carrying not just a baby, that would have been, uh, I'm sure, exciting by itself, but, but she was going to tell her that she was carrying the Messiah. And when she opened the door upon hearing the news that, that, that she was carrying the Messiah, the Bible tells us that John began to leap inside of Elizabeth's womb. I know she was probably just a, a, a little messed up right there, a little bit disoriented because number one, you child are carrying the Messiah. And number two, my baby has just now decided to move. And see, see, most people will tell you that the reason that John began to leap at the salutation of Mary was because somehow, some way in his spirit, John knew that he met somebody that, that he was ordained to meet. He knew some way, somehow he knew something that he didn't know that he knew. He somehow knew when he heard the Messiah that something in him said, my purpose has come alive. It was the, the relationship that the two of them had was a very purpose driven relationship. And, and I want to say to somebody this morning, don't ever underestimate the moment when you find yourself meeting someone that causes something inside of you to leap. Don't ever underestimate that moment. Do you know what I'm talking about? When you find yourself meeting somebody and something says, God, I, I, I don't understand this and I don't know what's going to come out of this, but I know that I know that I know that there's some kind of a connection that's deeper than what the eyes can see. John is inside his mother's womb, just jumping up and down saying, mom, that's the guy. That's the one. He's the one that I, I am his forerunner. He is the reason that I am even coming into the earth. So whatever you do don't underestimate when you find yourself connected and something is leaping inside of you because that might just be the absolute purpose for which you were born you may not know how it's going to work out you may not know how you're going to connect you may not know what you're going to do with them you may not know any of that that right there but what you do know is that this right here is not your ordinary relationship relationship. Look at somebody and tell them there's something different about this. Look at somebody else and say, look for the leap. In other words, stop running after relationships where there is nothing leaping inside of you. You are going to get tired. You're going to get exhausted. You are going to be spending your, pur your purpose on a place where you have no business spending it all because something you, you just ran. You didn't wait for the leap. So touch somebody again and tell them, wait for the leap. We did not have the privilege of watching uh, every step along the journey that these two made. We, we don't know what every step was, but what we do know is that when they came together, 
they would change the world forever. Because there are some connections in life that when you hook up, everything changes. John was the man with whose appearance we have the burial of the old dispensation and we have the emergence of the new. He is the man who in one hand, he held the Old Testament and in the other hand, he held the new. John was a very strange, peculiar kind of guy. He was a strange preacher. He had one message and he preached it everywhere he went. And if they got tired of hearing it, he didn't care. He was on assignment. He was, he was totally, he totally defied the religious community of his day. In other words, John was that preacher that danced to the beat of a different drum. He chose to eat things like wild locusts and honey. He chose for his clothes to be that of camel's hair. And instead of taking his ministry uptown into the limelight, he took it out of town into the wilderness. He refuses all titles. He refuses perks of ministry. He refuses the cliques and he refuses the clubs and he refuses the culture and says, okay, this is your culture, but this is not my culture. I am here to obey God. And he completely refuses to be a priest like his father was. And he just simply chooses to be called a voice crying in the wilderness. Now, if a title ever fit anybody, that title right there really fit John because John would cry and he would cry until Israel would leave the city and they would come out into the wilderness to hear him cry. And every time they heard him cry, what was he crying about? He was crying, repent for the kingdom of God of heaven is at hand. He cried until there was a complete political uprising. He cried until every village and every town and every tent and every community began to talk about him. John would baptize people into repentance and then he would always tell them, but there is one that is coming after me who is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. And he, I'm baptizing you in water, but he is going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. See, he knew his limitations. He knew what his lane was. And he was determined to stay in his lane and do his job well. He preached to multitudes, baptizing multitudes in the Jordan River. And that, I'm talking about the river that flowed into the Dead Sea, which represented our sin flowing into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered remembered anymore. I'm talking about he would baptize people in the river, the river whose waters Israel crossed over in order to get to the promised land. It was, it was the Jordan that, that they carried the Ark of the Covenant into, causing the water to stand at attention. It was the place where the priests pulled 12 stones at the point where their feet stood Firm. It was in these particular waters where John stood baptizing thousands of people that had gathered around to hear him preach. And in the middle of one particular message on one particular day, John happens to look up and he sees a young man in the back of the crowd. And when he laid eyes on him, the Bible said that John looked at him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God 
that taketh away the sins of the world. And when he said that, the crowd began to separate and the crowd began to look around. They all wanted to see who this was. And out of the crowd emerged the lion of the tribe of Judah. Out of the crowd came the seed of Abraham. Out of the crowd came the root of Jesse. Out of the crowd came God's treasure, God's masterpiece, God's work of art. He came stepping out from amongst men. He was amongst men, but he was more than men. And now he is standing in the midst of the Jordan to make a long story short with John. And we are about to pull back the curtains and experience an awesome event that happened. This is the first time in that history records the two of them meeting since they were jumping around in their mother's wombs together. They go from the womb of their mothers to now they are standing in the Jordan. They were in the water in their mother's wombs. Are y'all following me? And now they're standing in the waters of Jordan. No wonder the clouds began to roll back. No, no wonder voices started speaking from heaven. No wonder the Spirit of God descended like a dove. They were reunited and it felt so good. Listen closely as the Holy Spirit allows us to hear the conversation that is happening between these two cousins. Jesus says, baptize me, John. John says, why are you asking me to baptize you? I am unworthy. You need to be the one that baptizes me. Jesus says, John, will you just listen to me? Suffer it to be so. God is doing something. And it is about to happen. It's about to be sealed right here. So I appreciate that you uh, have pointed me out of the crowd. And, and, and trust me, I know that you're not worthy. But I need a divine endorsement on my life in order to do what I have got to do. In order for me to do and go and become what I have got to do and go and, and become. I need it to be more than just a man that pointed out a man. I need heaven to open up over me so I'm telling you suffer it to be so now if Jesus need if he needed a divine endorsement who are we to think I don't need nobody telling me what to I don't need nobody approving of my ministry let me ask the question again if Jesus needed the heavens to open and the glory to come down on his life how much more do you and I need that same glory John is rather confused but he is standing in the water and he is holding in his arms his redeemer. He is holding in his arms his deliverer. He is holding in his arms his savior. Yes, it's his cousin, but it is also the savior, the redeemer of the world. Now, John has no idea what is getting ready to happen when he lifts him up out of the water. He has no idea that a voice from heaven is about to speak and it is going to say, this is my, I might have dropped him, I don't know. If I'd have heard a voice from heaven, I, I, I might have said, whoa, I, can't, I don't know if I can hold you up. But he held him and he said, when the voice said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Look at God. He done brought Jesus from the background. The people that were there, you know, they ignored him when they first seen him back there because that's how people are when they don't really, it's not you they came to see. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. 
And you're lucky if you get that excuse me today because people can be so rude. <laughs> but now, somebody say now, but now everybody is looking. And, and, and the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son. He is not just a prophet. He is my son. He is not just a priest. This is my son. He is my beloved son. And when the heavens started speaking, every eye began looking toward the direction that spoke. The Spirit of God fell on him like a robe. It clothed him like a robe. For God had crowned him at that moment with glory and he had crowned him with honor. And all eyes were now witnessing the coronation of the king. I bet you wish you'd have been a little nicer when he was was in the background. Look at somebody and say, be careful how you treat me. You might not know who I am. You might not know who I am. With one snap of the finger, with one turn of the stage, and it doesn't take God long to turn a stage. He will turn a stage any way that he wants, any how that he wants, and he'll blow everybody else away as he stands there and turn the stage. But with one turn of the stage, one event, and now just like that, God has caused the carpenter's son, the carpenter's son, Jesus to become the conversation piece in all of the palaces of Israel. In one moment, God has jumped on the center, the stage, jumped center stage in the life of Jesus, and He has pushed Him out of the shadows and into the light. One push from God. That's why you got to be ready. I said, That's why you can't get ready. You got to be ready because one push from God and you'll be standing in a place that you know you don't deserve to be there and you'll think in your mind Lord why me of all people why did you do this for me so that's why you got to get ready when nobody is looking because just one touch from God and he'll pull you out of the crowd and have every eye in the place looking up on you look at somebody and tell them be ready be ready be ready he was pushed out of the shadow and now he's, he's standing in the light. And now you got tax collectors that want to serve him. Now you've got physicians that want to be a part of his board of directors. Now you've got business owners who are leaving their businesses all just so that they can become a part of his ministry. Because when God gives you favor, it causes even your enemies to be at peace with you. Yeah, and, and, and this would have been a wonderful grand finale. Uh, it would have been a wonderful grand finale to a wonderful event if it had not been for the next chapter, the next verse, and the next word. What was the next word? Huh? Somebody said it. Then. Somebody shout, then. then. All of that has happened. They're in celebration mode. And then. Hmm. The word then is a problem. It's the problem with the whole story. Because it could have just ended happily ever after. We have crowned him the king. Heaven has endorsed him. Heaven has smiled on him. He is clothed with glory and splendor. And if it could have ended that way, how awesome would that have been? But it didn't because of one word. And the word was, say it with me. Right at the summit of his success. Right at the time that now people have carried his name into every village. Jesus, Jesus, you know Jesus. He's the, he was the carpenter's son, but oh, John baptized him. And when he brought him up out of the water, heaven opened him and spoke over his life. You know, I, 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 right at that moment, right at the time, he became a household word. Right at 
the moment that the clouds parted, right at the moment that the heavens started talking about him, right at the moment that the anointing began to fall on him, then, isn't it amazing? The timing of trouble. Isn't it really? Think about it. I mean, it doesn't come when you ain't got nothing going on. Okay? It, it, it doesn't come when you got time to deal with it. All this time I've been over here and you ain't said nothing. Now that God is going to use my life, now you want to show up and get in my faith. See, it doesn't come when you're standing over there in the dark. It waits until somebody shines a light on you and then. Now, if you all read that like I read it, that one word, then if you just read it, if, if you read the whole backstory and you didn't, and then you hit the word then, you might think, well, it's, it's time for me to rebuke the devil. Oh no, God has raised him up. Oh no, the heavens have spoken. Get behind me, Satan. However, you gotta continue to read on to get the real understanding of what is actually going on in the story. So right after the word, then comes these words. The spirit led him. The same spirit that had just pointed him out and that had just marked him, that had just endorsed, uh, endorsed him and had just crowned him and anointed him, that same spirit led him into the wilderness away from the celebration, away from the crowd, away from the success of the moment, away from the applause of men, I have a problem with that right there. The same spirit, you just raised me up and now you gonna shut me down? Yes, the same God that just promoted him has now ushered him out of success over into suffering, out of triumph over into trouble. He's ushered him out of the crowd over into a corner the same God that led him into the limelight and had all eyes turned up on him has now led him into the dark. Can that really happen? <laughs> oh, just look at somebody and answer that question. Oh, yes. From time to time, the same God that gave you the victory will turn around and give you a wilderness with your name on it. Somebody knows what I'm talking about in this room today. God did not even wait until the party was completely over. They're celebrating. And now Jesus is like, people, I bet you anything, because I know people are, they were probably apologize. I'm so sorry. I didn't know that was you that was standing. I really, I, and Jesus being Jesus was like, oh, no problem. Don't worry. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not an issue at all. And they're celebrating. And then here, all of a sudden comes God. And he says, hey, follow me. I'm taking you into a fruitless lifeless, desolate, wilderness, season in your life, a place that you'll find yourself stripped of everything that brings you comfort. It's, I'm taking you into a season of loneliness. I'm taking, why? I just met all these new people. They love me. I'm taking you into a season of barrenness. What a shock it must have been on Jesus. 
in the blink of an eye, he goes from being celebrated to isolated. And now there's been 40 days with no word from heaven and no word from hell. 40 days without a cold drink of water. 40 days without the morsel of a bread, not even a bread crumb has he had. And after, after 40 days, we would think and we would almost expect and we would almost demand that we hear from God. Don't lie. Some of y'all won't go a day. I got to hear from God. I'm going on a 24 hour fast. But it had been 40 days. And the Bible said after, after he had fasted 40 days, not only did God not come, the enemy came. Not God, not the angels, but the enemy came after 40 days. The Bible says in Matthew 4 and 2, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was, let me tell you something. I guarantee they weren't doing that Daniel fast or, or you, you can only eat this, but you can't eat that. No, he did not have anything. And the Bible said that after he had went 40 days and 40 nights, he was what? Hungry. Hungry. Notice that it doesn't say he was thirsty but it said he was hungry. And here's what I want, why I want you to notice that. Because the attack that is about to come in his life comes in an area of his weakness. Because the attack will always come to the area of our weakness. See, the devil doesn't fight you where you are strong, okay? He fights you where you are weak. He fights you where you are vulnerable. And if you will look at the place where the enemy attacks you the most, then you will see the places in your life where you are the most vulnerable and you need to be strengthened. Matthew 4 and 3 goes on and it says, Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you really are the Son of God, command that these stones become not water. He could have as easily said, Turn this stone into water. He didn't say that. Why? Because before that, we learned that his weakness was that he was hungry. So the attack came where he was weak. Are y'all following that? Okay. Here's what he says to him. If you are, okay, if you are who you are saying that you are, listen to me, church. The enemy is attacking his identity as if it were up for discussion. He is attacking his identity as if it were debatable. It has already been stated from the heavens as to who he is. The heavens open and the heavens declare this is my beloved Woo. he was who he said he was listen don't be shocked when the enemy comes to attack what God has said that you already are I am already 
his son. Whatever area that you have received a prophecy in, whatever area that you have received a word from God over your life, expect that to be the area where the enemy is coming to attack you. Don't y'all know it's the truth? People will prophesy to you and tell you you're about to be blessed. God's about to open the windows. He's about to give you favor. And you go home and hell breaks out on the left and the right. And we think, well, that must have not been a word from God. No, it was a word from God because the enemy always attacks your life over the word. He said, if thou be the son of God, if you're really saved, If you're really blessed, if you really got favor on your life, if you're really anointed, if you really are the son of God, he always attacks your identity. He always causes you to question, who am I? You are who God made you to be. And there is a lie from hell that is going off in your head trying to get you to figure out who you already are. Look at somebody and tell them I am who I am. If you are who you say you are, command these stones to be made bread. He's being attacked where he is weak. This was what he had to say about that. In verse four, it says, and he answered and he said, "Uh, let me check what the contract says. (laughs) Let me check what has been written in the contract. Let Let me check what the word says about this. And he, Jesus answered the enemy and said, it is written. Well, you see, that's why you got to know what is written, not just what is preached. Come on. You got to know what is. Look at somebody and ask them, do you know what's been written? You can't just take something that the pastor said or something that the teacher said or somebody, something that somebody said on Fison. You better check all of that out. And you need to look into that because you have got to know what is written when you start fighting an enemy that is fiercely determined to bring you down. You look at him and say, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. My contract says, if it ain't God, I ain't got to listen to you. So thank you, but I don't live by bread that is on my table. I don't live by what my what feeds my flesh. I live by what goes into my spirit. I live by what I devour in my quiet times with God. I live by what I feed my spirit man. And the reason that so many people are constantly losing in the fight with their flesh is because your flesh man eats better than your spirit man does. And when that happens, your flesh is stronger than your spirit. Your spirit is anorexic and your flesh is morbidly obese. Because we snack all day long on things that gratify the flesh, things that strengthen the flesh. But we can go all week long without prayer, without the word of God, without really tapping into worship, and without entering into the presence of God. So thus I say, our flesh eats better than our spirit, and that's why it's stronger than our spirit. And that's why it prevails over our spirit. That which I would not do, that I do. And and instead of backing up and not doing it, we do it simply because our spirit man is not as strong as our flesh man is. 
and our spirit, our spirit has been weakened because man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every rhema word. Somebody look at your neighbor and say rhema. Y'all know what a rhema word is? A rhema word is a living word. It's like when you're looking at the scripture and you've heard the same scripture all of your life and you know it, you know it was there, you know it is written, but when all of a sudden you look at it and you see something you didn't see, all of a sudden something comes alive. That's because that word has become a rhema word. And so we live by every rhema word. It is a word that comes from God that has the ability to keep you. It is a word that has been spoken over your life. Let me tell you something. The reason some of us are still here is because of the word of God that was spoken over your life. Something your mama said out of the word about you. Something your daddy said. Your grandmother said. Something you read and it came alive in you. Yes, something is sustaining you that is greater than the food that you are eating that is on your table. Because you should have done been dead. I should have been dead. But the reason we are not dead is because there is a word that has been somebody. Help me thank him for the word that was spoken over. Parents, speak the word of God over your children. I'm going to tell you something. The devil comes to kill and steal and destroy. And it might look like he wins for a moment. But at the end of it all, it is written. As for me and my house, we will serve. You can't kill us because I got a word over my life. I got a prophecy over my life. I got a promise over my life. How, I want to ask you today, how many times has the word that was spoken over you jumped out and got in between you and the attack? It would have hit you. Oh, but a word that was spoken. Woo! I said there was a word that was spoken. When David would play so that he could crush the tormenting spirit that Saul was battling with. One day Saul said, I'm going to shoot my arrow at him. And when he shot the arrow, David just kept on playing. Why? Because the word that was over David's life that said, you shall be the next king. That word jumped up. Y'all, I can't help it, but it makes me think of what we've been watching on TV all this week. When they would shoot things toward Israel, what is that thing that they said? What is it called? That, that they said, it comes up and it catches the... It, it intercepts it. That's what I'm trying to tell you. There has been a word that intercepts every devil, every snare, every foul, every spirit that comes to kill. There he are. Oh. Look at somebody, tell him I got a word. And if you wonder why we praise God, like we praise God, it's because he kept us from danger, seed, and things you were oblivious to. The word chopped in between you and the enemy and said, though a thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, it will not come nigh your He shall give his angels charge 
over thee to keep thee according to Psalms 91 to keep thee in all of your your crazy ways your lying ways your sinful ways your hateful and unfaithful ways your rebellious ways your cheating ways he gave his angel it's been nobody but Jesus look at your neighbor and say it should have been me I should have been dead I should have been gone I should have been in the grave but he kept me and I'm living today by every word that comes out of the mouth of God because God has been talking about me look up to heaven and say God keep talking about me keep talking about my family keep talking about my children keep talking about my marriage Look at your neighbor say, I hear somebody talking over your life. That's why we got to keep on praising him. Praise him because the roof that's over your head and the food that's on your table and the clothes that's on your back is not because of your goodness it's because of your word Woo! it's not because of your righteousness it's because of the word it's not because of your money it's because of the word it's not because you got a big title it's because of your word it's not because of your education it's because of the word it is what heaven has declared over you and let me tell you this you can want me dead all day long but as long as heaven is still talking about me tell somebody I shall live and not die I'm still here because he is still talking Sit down, y'all. Sit down. Because I'm not there yet. I'm almost there, but I'm not there yet. He's talking about you. Somebody's talking about you. You ain't got to worry about this one, and you ain't got to cry over this one, and you ain't got to feel intimidated over this. No, he's talking about God. God is the one that's talking. Oh, and he's not a man that he should lie. And if he said it, he's going to do it. And if he spoke it, he will bring it to pass. Verse 5 says, verse 5. Verse 5 says, then, oh, there we are with that word again. Then the devil took him up into the holy city. And the devil set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are, are you kidding me? We going back through this again. The heavens have opened and already told you who I was. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, woo, wait a minute. That it is written is not Jesus talking. That it 
is written is the devil talking because even the devil knows what has been written about the saints of God. It is written. Go ahead and throw yourself down here because it's written that he will give his angels charge over thee. Notice again. Every attack deals with the issue of his identity. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. If I were the devil, I would fight you too. Because once you know who you are in God, strongholds are broken. Woo! Once you know who you are in God, nothing can hold you back. Nothing can limit you. Nothing can become an obstacle that is so high that you cannot get over it. Why? Because you know who you are. And you've got to know who you are. And you've also got to know that the enemy, hear me, this is important. The enemy cannot tempt you beyond your own self-image. Think about that, Selah. The enemy cannot tempt you beyond your own self-image. If the enemy came to me and said, and I've lived with this for times in my life, especially in the early years, but if the enemy came to me and said, you are not a preacher, you are not allowed to be a preacher. You cannot stand on our platform. You know what I did when they told me that? I said, I'm going to keep on preaching. And because I kept on preaching, God kept on delivering. And I watched them. They'd sit up here and fall asleep trying to do anything. They, I remember one place in particular, all the bishops were lined up in their bishop chairs that had wheels on them. And I looked at them. I don't, you don't have to tell it, baby. I, I, I'm telling you. Uh, but but I, he wants to give you names, numbers, addresses. But vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and I will. And he repaid it. Ain't nothing like God paying you back for the mess that you had to go through. I would preach and the people would holler and the glory would fall until the bishops had to wake up and they'd start rolling their chairs around looking at each other. That's the glory. That's the glory. And I thought they didn't like me, but they turned around and brought me back the next year and the next year and the next year. You know why? Because I kept on being who I was and I was not intimidated from being who I was. The enemy cannot tempt you beyond your own self-image. And when you know who you are, the enemy has no power over your life in that area. If you are who you say you are, cast yourself down. For it's already been written that he will give his angels charge over you. And in their hands, they shall bear thee up lest at any time thou should dash thy foot against the stone. Will you just listen to the devil? He's trying to get Jesus to manipulate the Father. I said he's trying to get Jesus to manipulate the Father. The devil is asking him, or the devil is using scripture. Oh, listen, if I don't say nothing else... I said a mouthful right there. The devil is using scripture to try to convince Jesus that it is okay to manipulate God. But Jesus saw the bigger picture and he had a broader concept. So he turns to the devil and says, yes, but the scripture also says that thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy 
So I'm going to tell you today, be careful about surrounding yourself with people who will try to maneuver you into a place where you are attempting to manipulate God. Be careful about surrounding yourself by people who will prophesy to you and say exactly what you want to hear. And because they know you and your circumstance, they nail it to a T. And then on top of that, they tag, thus saith the Lord, at the end of it. Because truly, and we accept it, because what what the truth is we don't want what God wants for us we want what we want for us so we lie on God and we attach his name to our agendas and we attach his name to self-serving lies without ever realizing what we're doing and what we are actually doing is we are taking the name of God in vain There was no question that the angels would have called him. If he'd have thrown himself off, the angels would have called him. But that wasn't the issue. The issue was that not everything that you want for you is what God wants for you. And contrary to what we may believe, God does not answer everything that you pray for like you pray for it to be answered. The prayers that God answers are prayers that are attached to his purpose. And when you start praying prayers that are attached to the purpose of God, it changes everything about your life. And so sometimes the reason God has to say no to you today is because what you want today may not be what you gonna want tomorrow. And so God has to not answer this or he has to tell you no because listen to me church the sign of a real maturity is not always getting what you want sometimes the sign of maturity is leaving whatever it is that you want in his hands and saying, God, whatever you want me to have, that's what I want. Woo. But doesn't the Bible say that he will give us the desire of our hearts? It most certainly does. That is actually exactly and precisely what the Bible says. But what the Bible says and what we think it means are two very different things. What that verse really means is that he will give you, no, let me back that up. He will not give you what you want, but he will give you what he wants you to have. He'll, he'll, in other words, he'll give you what you should want, okay? He gives you the desire, he, you got that desire in your heart? It's holy, it lines up with the word of God. That might just be because God has given you that desire. And when he put that desire in you, it's something made it, made it attractive to you. And you started aligning yourself in prayer. And you started praying about the desire that God put in your heart. And the next thing you know, God answers that prayer because the prayer you are praying has been lined up with his purpose for your life everybody says oh prayer changes things and it, it could it might but the truth of the matter is prayer changes you until things change Lord have you ever found yourself saying Lord 
I'm just asking you. You're to change things. The things don't change. But all of a sudden, your perception about those things, they begin to change. And sometimes God just changes your perception of the things that you're praying about. Some of the things that we are rebuking are really the things that God has sent into our life. It's the things that God has allowed to come into our life. And if he just brings us out just because we want to be out, listen, you may never learn what it is that he wanted you to learn while you were in there. If God takes us out of everything that we want to be taken out of, we will never grow grow and we will never mature and we will never live our whole life and we will live our life but we'll live it as an immature believer and we will never become strong in the power of the Lord and of his might and for that reason we've got to know that some prayers are not meant to be answered thou shalt not Tempt the Lord thy God. In other words, we don't just pray to see what God is capable of. I'm going to say that again. We don't just pray to see what God is capable of. His ability is not determined by our answered prayer. I'm disrupting your thinking today. Bishop Jakes has a book about that. Go buy it. Just because God doesn't do it in your life doesn't mean that he can't. Hear me. He doesn't have to heal us to prove he is a healer. He doesn't have to deliver us to prove that he is a deliverer. If he never delivers another person, he is still God. And he knows that he is God. Somebody says, God, if you don't heal me, then people will not, they're not going to believe that you are a healer. And God says, I ain't worried about what people believe. I don't care what they believe that I am. I, I care if they think I can do it or not because I'm not proving anything to them. I ain't wasting time trying to prove anything to skeptics. Should I decide to heal you? It will not be based on trying to prove anything to anybody else. If I do heal you, it will be based on the covenant that I have with you. So I don't need them to believe in me so that I can be who I am, I am that I am. God was God before you ever had a birthday. I'll be God after you are buried and gone. I'll never be manipulated by you. I'll never be manipulated by people twisting the scripture. I am God and I'm God all by myself. Twice, I'm almost finished. Twice, he tempted him. But now he is about to cross a line. And he says in verse 8, and again, the devil took him up. Let me tell you something right there. Every one of these encounters took him higher. That's why you can't just say it. Ooh, this must be God for me because it's taken me up. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain, showed him all of the kingdoms of the world and all of their glory. I'm sure he's so impressed. Notice he did not try to say, I made that, I made that. And he said to him, the enemy said to him, all these things, I'm going to give them to you. You're such an idiot. All of these things I'm going to give to you. If you will just fall down 
and worship me. Notice the principle that is at work in verse 9. Satan said, I will give if you will worship. Now, if Satan had the audacity to say that, how much more authority does God have to say that? Here's what I want you to know. Write this down. Worship equals acquisition. Are you following me? I said true, genuine worship equals acquisition. Do you know why I'm not worried today about standing on their platform? Because I worship God and he gave me my own. I don't fight who I am or, or, or people that want to challenge who I am. I am who I am by the grace of God. And because I recognize that and because I worship him, he brings acquisition into my life. Worship equals obtaining. Let me say it like this. You cannot worship and not receive. You cannot worship and stay the same. You cannot worship and not have increase come into your life. And worship just doesn't mean houses and cars and fine clothes. No, worship gives you kingdoms. Worship gives you glory. It gives you power. It gives you authority. It gives you peace on your job. It gives you peace in your home. It it gives you beauty for ashes. Real worship changes your life. Real worship releases potential. Real worship releases provision. And real worship releases purpose. And if you don't know your purpose, then I dare you to worship. Why, Pastor Brady? Because your identity is locked up in God. And the more you worship, the more you will come to know him. And the more you come to know him, the more you will come to know yourself. Let me say that again. Your identity is locked up in God. If you don't know your purpose and who you are, just worship. Because the more that you worship him, I'm going to tell you, the more you will come to know him. And the more that you come to know him, the more you will come to know yourself. Because you can't tell him who he is. And him not tell you who you are. You, you can't tell him that he's able to do something and then him not do something in your life. When you tell him all power belongs to God. And those are words that you can worship, uh, use in worship. And, and you know what? Some of y'all just need to stretch your vocabulary in worship. You need to learn some things. Go home and get a thesaurus and start looking up the word power and say, God, not, not just power. Your word says it is written that all power belongs to God, but all authority belongs to you. You are in control. All control belongs to you. You sit high and you look low. You are God all by yourself. Oh, you don't need any matches because you're fire all by yourself. You are the great I am, the everlasting father, the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, my book walk, my strength, my joy, my life, my kinsman redeemer, my counselor, my way maker, my savior, my rock in a weary land. You're a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Your peace when I need peace. Your victory when I need victory. You are all that to me. Look at somebody and 
and say stretch. Practice at home. Practice in your car. And when you come in here and the music gets quiet, you don't just get quiet. You start telling God, you're an amazing God. You are my joy. You're my counselor, my comforter. Get two people and tell him stretch. When you tell him all power belongs to God, he tells you wherever the sole of your foot trods, I will give it to you. The more you exalt him, the more he will raise you. The more you lift him, the more you will be lifted. The louder you proclaim who he is, the louder he proclaims who you are. And if you are not worshiping, then you don't really know who you are. Because you can never know who you are without first knowing who he is. You can come to church and you can lift your hands and you can just do what everybody else is doing. But there is no heart connection. But worship is bringing your heart to Jesus. Jesus knew who he was. He knew who he was. And he said, when he hit that, when the enemy said to him, if he, I'll give you all this if you just bow down and worship me. Jesus said, okay, let me tell you something. I have put up with your mouth through this whole test. But right now, I'm all, I want you out of my, get out of my face. Because let me tell you, worship you, that ain't even an issue. That ain't happening. Look at somebody, tell them, that ain't happening. That ain't happening. For why? Because it is written that thou shalt worship the Lord and him only shalt thou serve. Verse 11 begins with the word then. Then the devil said, let me get out of here. Then the devil left him. You want to let the devil, you want the devil to leave you alone? Hit somebody and say, then worship. You've got to worship. If he ain't leaving you alone, maybe you ain't really worshiping. Because the minute that Jesus said, shut your face. Then the enemy left him. You want the devil out of your money? Worship. You want him out of your marriage? Worship. You want him out of your kids? Worship. It's not my job to fight, but it is my job to worship. And if my worship bothers you, then you got to get over it. Look at somebody that's been looking at you crazy all day and tell him, get over it, baby, get over it. I got to worship because I'm running the devil out of my house with my worship. I'm running him off my body when I worship. I'm running him out of my job when I worship. I'm running him out of my child when I worship. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. When you know who you are, when you know how to worship, the enemy has no other choice but to get out of your life. I love this. Don't move. We're getting ready to close. This text began with God affirming Christ. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And it ends with Christ affirming God. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only. So the whole battle, the whole temptation.
begins with the devil questioning who Jesus is. But it ends with Jesus telling the devil who God is. You may not be the greatest singer in the church. You may not be the greatest dancer in the church. You may not be able to carry a tune. But if you will learn the art of lifting up your voice and start singing to God, cherubims and seraphims have to shut up. Shh. I want to hear Potter's House North sing today. What? What do you mean? You want to hear Cheryl sing today? Yeah, that's exactly what I want to hear. Because, see, you have not got a choice. You have cherubim, seraphims. You have no other choice but to praise me. But her, she has the choice. Look at somebody and say, neighbor, there's something about my praise that he loves. Woo, there's something about the way I speak his name. Jesus. The Hosannas, the Hallelujahs, they're sung to him by angels above. But there's something about it. He loves the sound of your voice. And out of every voice that calls on him, he knows when yours is missing. So let me close. I need about, I need about seven or eight guys up here real quick. Just stand right here. Line up facing me. And, but, but do it in like, make, make me a couple rows. Come on, come on. One, two, three, four, five. Come on, yeah, come on. Just line up. Come on, I need, I, need, I need to make it even. Come on, come on. Okay, I need, I need one more row. Just come on, guys. Y'all, come on, y'all guys. Come on. Yeah, here they come, here they come, here they come. Okay, come on, come on. Yep, got it. Come on, just file in over there somewhere. Give me another row. Oh, I love what he's doing. He's, doing. he's like, mm, I'm going to the front of that. I know who I am. I think he's right. Uh, Tina, you and Lana, come, come here. Stand right there together. If I read that verse correctly, it does not say that he walked beside him into the wilderness because it would have looked like this. It does not say that he took a step back and they went into the wilderness. Here's what it says. This is why when you read your Bible, you have to read it word by word, not verse by verse. There's so many truths that are packed in a verse. But the Bible said that he led them, him, into the wilderness. Y'all are the wilderness. And I'm leading them into the wilderness. words, if I got to go into a wilderness, I want to know they didn't even give me no resistance, okay? I got to know that there is a God that is going before me. That's what it looks like when God goes before you. Come on back, girls. Y'all can give me a little bit of resistance this time, okay? Come on. 
we got to go through a wilderness. we got to get to the other side. There's going to be days that you feel like quitting. There's going to be days that you feel like throwing in the towel. There's going to be days that you say, this is too much for me. But on those days, remember, he is leading you. He is pushing back powers. And he pushes principalities. Look at somebody and tell him he'll push it out of your way. He's leading you. He goes in front of you. He takes the punches. He takes the blows. He takes the animosity. He takes and faces what you have to face. Look at your neighbor and say, who's in front of you? Who's in front of you pushing back the briars? Who's in front of you taking the pain? Who's in front of you clearing the path? You would have been dead had he not been the one that was in front of you. And I don't know about you, but it helps me to know. Gentlemen, I thank you. Where is the guy? Where is my friend here? Come right here. Bishop, you have some, you have a hundred dollars in your pocket anywhere? Because this guy, I love what he did. He's like, I'm walking to the front of the line. He didn't care. Pastor said, look here, look here, look here. Woo! Now, like I said, Bishop, you have one. You better loose it. Loose it and let it go. <laughs> Tina, I got one. Get it. Get it out of my wallet. Woo! Hey, I believe somebody's about to carry $100 bills like you carry $1 bills. Boy, God's hand is on your life. He'll go before you and he'll push back powers and principalities. Never forget who you are. Never forget that he's marked you. Never forget that you're not by yourself. Never forget that God has raised you up and anointed you and he has a plan for your life. And he will provide every step of the way. Don't move, don't move. Don't move. It helps me to know when I am in a wilderness moment that God will be faithful to go before me. Know that today. That if you're facing a wilderness moment in your house, in your family, in your career, in your life, in your finances, in your health, in your relationships, it used to be fruitful, but it's wilderness like now. Remember that if you invite God, he will go before you. And he will pull down everything that tries to stop you in. Look at somebody and tell them you got to get to the other side of this. Look at somebody else and tell them we will, we will, we will get to the other side of this. But how do we get there? Two things that brought Jesus through his wilderness moments. One was the word. He knew what was written. Two was worship. Later on, further down in this text, Jesus gets weary from the battle. He gets tired. And he laid his head up against a rock. The Bible said when he did, that the angels came 
And the angels began to minister to him. From time to time, just when you think you can't take it another day, God will send ministering angels. Send angels, oh God. All around the world, send angels. Look, guys, this is what I love about it. They did not wait for Jesus to leave the wilderness and then they helped him. No, they came right into the middle of where he was and they ministered to them. I don't know who this message is for today, but I want to tell somebody that if you'll make the word and you'll make worship a priority in your life, he will send the angels. to minister to you.